cameras in the rules committee. My gosh. <laughs> Good morning. Rules committee will please come to order. We're here today. Madam Chair, you don't have order. <laughs> We're here today to consider H.R. 4872, the Reconciliation Act of 2010. I'm happy to welcome the distinguished chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Waxman, and the committee's ranking member, Mr. Barton. If you gentlemen will please come forward. We're happy to have you. We're going to do all at once, and the distinguished chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. You want us all oh, you want us all I up do. here? I want all of you up here at once. Okay, good. I think the last Spartan, time how are you? I did this, I was surrounded Sam? by you and Henry. Is Sandy here? Yeah, it's been a long day. Is Mr. Levin here? Please do. And it looks like you got the call right in there, but John's Mr. Here's Sandy. Mr. Sandy's Ryan's here. Here's here Sandy. Here's Sandy, Dave uh, Cam. Mr. Sarah and Mr. Ryan. We have Mr. Oh, 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 Paul. Wherever you want to hear. Somebody needs to scoot over here. Good morning. One of you, one place and one of you. Are there going to come in? It's all your enemies. Oh, yeah. Sarah doesn't appear to be here. Good morning. How are you? Good. Was he representing John? It's cozy. Cozy. It's very cozy. I just thought. One more. Congrats to the chairman. Yes, I'm sure he's a little bit. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. We are pleased to have such a distinguished group of guests with us this morning. Uh, and we are going to start, with, uh, we will, with uh, the Chairman of Energy and Commerce from California, Mr. Waxman. If you will begin, and Mr. Waxman, as always, we will accept your full statement into the record, and you may summarize if you choose. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman, and members of the Rules Committee. Thanks, with me. Can we clear the room back there, please, so we can get started? We are on the verge of taking a decisive step to provide access for all Americans to affordable, quality health care. Health insurance today is failing our families and our businesses. If we do nothing, the system will go bankrupt, premiums will keep skyrocketing, benefits will keep getting slashed, and what you get will cost you much, much more, and our country's expenditures on health care will continue to grow unchecked. Today, unfortunately, Americans with health insurance know that they are just one serious illness away from debt, losing their home, and bankruptcy. With this legislation, we provide Americans security that they will always be able to afford and access health care for themselves and their families. First and foremost, this package of measures provides health insurance security for all Americans. It builds on the system that we have, what works, and it reforms what does not work. You can keep your doctor and your health care providers. If you lose your job, you will not lose access to health care. And if you have a pre-existing medical condition, you will not be denied health insurance or charged more for that insurance. Health reform provides significant benefits that will be delivered shortly after enactment and able to be used by the American people in this calendar year. For example, seniors will see immediately with their Medicare prescription drug costs a $250 rebate. Insurance companies will not be able to cancel your insurance when you get sick, and parents will have the option of keeping their children up to the age of 26 on their insurance policies. When we fully implement this reform, we bring 32 million Americans 
who are now uninsured into the health insurance system. This expansion is not only equitable, it enables the substantial insurance reforms that are needed to stop the abuses and discrimination currently in the insurance market. In addition, even within the strict limits of the reconciliation rules, we have taken strong and effective action to improve the Senate bill, to make its provisions more effective, more equitable, more progressive, and more consistent with the overarching goals of ensuring affordable access to quality health insurance. The principal improvements we have made under our committee's jurisdiction include closing the gap in Medicare prescription drug, drug coverage by 2020, including a rebate this year to eligible seniors, eliminating the special Medicaid deal for Nebraska, and increasing federal matching rates to all states for the cost of services to newly eligible individuals beginning in 2014, improving federal Medicaid payments to states that, are, that now cover low-income childless adults as they, uh, so they are treated equitably, increasing Medicaid payment rates for primary care physicians so the, the new Medicaid beneficiaries will have access to primary care, greater investments into community health centers, reforming Medicare Advantage, ensuring Medicare sustainability, and strengthening Medicare services. Health reform is not only a moral imperative, it is an economic one. It will reduce the deficit by more than a trillion dollars over the next two decades. I look forward to the deliberation of this committee and uh, to your approval of a rule and the House approval tomorrow of the most important health legislation since Medicare and the most important package of domestic legislation since Social Security in 1935. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Barton. Is this, a, <clears throat> excuse me, is this on? Does it work? So. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chairwoman and members of the Distinguished Rules Committee. Uh, I've been in Congress 26 years, um, the only member of the dais that's been here as long or longer than me is Mr. Dreyer. I think I've got everybody else outranked. I don't have Mr. Miller, Mr. Levin, Mr. Waxman here at the table. Uh, this is the most uh, important domestic policy issue in my time in the Congress. Um, so I think it's a very serious, serious uh, meeting today of your Rules Committee. I've got a statement that I'll put in the record, but what I really want to emphasize is that I hope whatever you and your wisdom decide to do, that you put up some sort of a rule that is based on regular order. So I, I want everybody to understand, if in fact a decision is made by your leadership to pass this under what is called the uh, self-executing or the demon pass, you're going to have a vote, or you're not going to have a vote, on a bill that passed the Senate on Christmas Eve. It comes to the House, and if the rule is passed, it is deemed that it is passed, and there will be no vote, no debate, on the substantive policy differences between the House and the Senate. Now, I am told that on its own, the bill that the Senate passed would not pass the House, because there's not a majority, there's not 216 votes in your conference to pass it. So, we start off, if that's the way you guys decide to do it, we start off with deeming something passed that nobody in the House really gets to debate or, or, or have an up or down vote on. And then we debate perfunctorily, maybe an hour, maybe two hours, I don't know how much time you're going to give us for debate, a reconciliation package that um, the only people that have really seen it in depth are those distinguished members of the rules of the of the budget committee and since 1983 which is the year before I got elected the Senate has only one time accepted a reconciliation package that came out of the house first so if the last 30 years are relevant, you're probably not going to get the Senate to agree to the changes that have been made in reconciliation. And if that happens, Madam Chairwoman, what you're going to have is the President is going to sign a bill that the House never voted on, up or down. The Senate passed on Christmas Eve, and it makes revolutionary changes 
in the way our health care system um, has heretofore been, uh, uh, been used, been done. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, you don't have to be a partisan Republican or a partisan Democrat to know that there are legitimate differences and that we need to try to alleviate those differences. You know, the Speaker of the House could appoint Mr. Waxman, Mr. Miller, Mr. Levin, whoever else on the majority side. Mr. Boehner could appoint, you know, one-third of the Republicans. We could go to conference with the Senate. And again, you can freeze the Republicans out if the majority of the Democrats in the House and the Senate can agree and sign the same conference report. You can then bring a bill back to the both bodies for an up or down vote. That's not easy. It's hard to do, but it would work. This process corrupts and prostitutes the system. I, I, I can't, you know, I know all of y'all personally, and I respect you. I would not use such language if I didn't really believe it. <clears throat> we are about to unleash a cultural war in this country if we use this process and don't allow the legitimate differences to be debated and hopefully moderated and compromised. So, you know, my main point is don't do <laughs> this demon pass. I mean, I, officially, I'm asking for an open rule. Now, I know I, that's not likely to happen, but you could do a modified closed rule. You could make a Republican substitute in order. You could make several amendments, the most important amendments, in order. We could have some sort of a debate tomorrow afternoon. And I might point out that as far as I can tell, in both the Senate bill and the reconciliation package, the main components in terms of policy change don't kick in for 2014. So it's not like we have to be here on a Sunday afternoon. It's not like we don't have enough time to actually have a debate. If you remember some of the debates on the, the Tax Reform Act of 1986, I know Mr. Dreyer was a part of that, Mr. Miller was a part of that, Mr. Levin was certainly a part of that. If you remember the de debate on the war resolution under, under the first Iraq Gulf War, we had extended debate. In fact, we let every member of the House that wanted to speak on the war resolution of the Iraq Gulf War. So, um, Madam Speaker, I could go through the substance, but, um, you know, we have a number of amendments that myself and members of the Energy and Commerce Committee are offering. Uh, I would hope... Uh, at a minimum, those amendments would be made in order to kick out some of the special deals that were put in uh, for various states and localities. And I can't emphasize strongly enough for the sanctity of the institution, we adopt a rule that is based on regular order and not some sleight of hand subterfuge uh, that was never intended for things of this sort. I know some may say, well, the Republican used it too. We did. But we did it for bills that had already passed the House or that there was at least agreement between the House and the Senate, and it was just an expedited process that was pretty well already agreed upon. That's not the case here. The majority party in the House and the Senate cannot even agree on what should be in the reconciliation package, as far as I can tell. So um, I do appreciate your, your courtesy of allowing me to testify. And I, I do hope that, um, that um, regular order will prevail. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Barton. I think we'll question these two witnesses for an energy and commerce and so they can be allowed to uh, leave the table. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. That is along that. with their staff <laughs> so that we can get more people to be seen. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, Mr. Barton, um, conference would have been wonderful. Uh, would have been wonderful for the last three years, but as you know, we've not been able to do that. And I know that uh, Senator McConnell announced last year that there would be no conference on this bill. I appreciate that you're the uh, bluebird of happiness. Uh, the bluebird of happiness? Yes, and that somehow we believe that we could do this all lovely and sweetness and light, but we just don't have any evidence to prove that. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I, I love to hear it. I agree with you. No, nothing would please me more than we were all working together uh, and we could try to get this done because it is the most important thing that I think I'll be voting on in my career here. And I 
hated that one of the parties has opted out uh, of something of this magnitude. But we have to play the hand that's dealt us. And so we, we're going to be, uh, be doing the best we can. But um, I've always appreciated your advice. Well, and, uh, could, could I comment on that briefly? Of course. Uh, the thing that I've probably worked hardest on in my time in the Congress was energy policy. Um, we passed a comprehensive energy bill when I was chairman back in 2005, but that same bill uh, did not get out of conference in 2003, uh, did not even get out of the Senate in 2001. It took three Congresses, but we did finally get a bill, and it did have bipartisan support. Uh, then Ranking Member Dingell signed the conference report. Um, approximately a third of the House Democrats voted for it, a majority of the Senate Democrats voted for it. Senator Bingaman and Chairman D uh, Ranking Member Dingell, myself and Mr. Domenici worked in a bipartisan fashion. It took six years, but we, it, it did happen. So I'm not saying that it's sweetness and light to go the regular order, but it, it brings everybody to the table and it forces compromises the, the reconciliation package that, 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 that uh, the, the Budget Committee has put together, the only people that have really had input into that uh, are, the, are the inside Democrats in the House and the Senate, and I guess the President and his staff. So it automatically is not going to have all the compromises that, that would if you had a little bit different uh, process like I've talked about. I don't know of anything that has had more hearings or more work I mean, we've gone over bills section by section in our caucuses and worked very hard on them. But I was here during the Clinton health care debate, which was very much the same, and I remember the things that were said about it. And uh, one of the worst for me uh, was the information that went out to senior citizens that under the Clinton health care plan, if by some chance a hapless uh, senior went to the wrong doctor, it was going to cost them under Clinton's plan $10,000 and maybe jail time. That's the kind of thing that we've been having to fight here. And I really have to stand up for my side. We, we have tried everywhere in the world to try to be bipartisan. We have wanted conferences. And we have simply had, as I said a while ago, have had to play the hand that has been dealt us. Uh, I wish we could have done better. Uh, and I think in time, everybody will see that what we've done here has made a good difference in the United States. And I, uh, uh, we, we have to get on with it. And Mr. Waxman, I thank you very much for all the good work that you've done and your staff. Thank you. Uh, I, I have no idea how many hours you've put in on this. Uh, I couldn't even begin to contemplate that. But I know, uh, like Anna Eshoo from California said yesterday, we feel like we've been pregnant for 17 months. Let's get <laughs> on with it already. Thank you all very much. Mr. Dreyer. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Let me just uh, first uh, say that I, I was told that when we came up today that we were going to hear from all of the witnesses and then we were going to question them. I know that a number of the members of the panel have very, very uh, important commitments that they would like to address. And so I'd like to propose that, I mean, I'll, I'll just make a statement and then maybe we could hear from the other witnesses, Madam Chair, as we were told before we came up, uh, and then and then go to questions, because if we exhaust and have every one of all 13 members of the Rules Committee ask Mr. Waxman and Mr. Barton questions, then it means that these other witnesses will be sitting here for a long period of time. So, um, well, Mr. Dry, I wasn't given that news. Okay, I, well, I was given that news. I don't know. It I was communicated to my staff. It was communicated to my staff that we were going to hear from the chairs and the ranking members of the committees, and then we were going to begin with the questions. Um, <clears throat> Well, it's fine with me if, if, if Mr. Klein will move over closer to Mr. Waxman so that Mr. Becerra can get over here by Mr. Ryan, and then we can have everybody at the table. Right. Is that just, okay? All right, All right yes. then we'll go ahead and, and then do that. I'm happy to move. All right, well, thank you. And then let us now hear we'll from, uh, we'll we will now hear from Mr. Levy from the Ways and Means Committee. Wait, no. Mr. Levin. Oh, oh yeah, there we go. <coughs> I'll let everybody be seated. Mr. Sarah. You're very welcome. Oh, it's a little, get a little close there, isn't it? Okay. That's, that's cozy. We're cozy here. But that's a lot of brain power. Cozy as we'll ever be. Stephen Bill is bringing everybody together. 
<laughs> Mr. Levin. You know, thank you for this opportunity. Let me say hello to some longtime colleagues and some newer <coughs> colleagues. I'm sorry, my back is to you. We face a challenge not only in this country, in this country, but in the country. Uh, is your microphone on? It isn't. This one it works. is on. Is it on? Oh, okay. It's on? Uh, that's better. Better? Mm -hmm. So today we face a, a challenge not only in this uh, Congress, but in the country. And I did, indeed, I think it's a crisis. Uh, for those who like their insurance, it's important that we be able to keep it. The problem is it's being too expensive to keep. The costs are going up. I look at my home state of Michigan, Blue Cross Blue Shield, that has a majority of the consumers in the state. They requested an increase of over 40%. As people are subject to what are called rescissions, just the termination of their policies, annual limits. They're subject to lifetime caps. The data aren't entirely clear, but a huge proportion of the bankruptcies in this country come because of medical costs. Uh, if people want to move, and many are locked in to their jobs because it's the only way they get insurance. But if they decide to move, they can be handicapped because of pre-existing conditions and they can't get their insurance. And then as we all know, we have 45 million Americans or more who don't have insurance. And so what this bill does is to build on the present system, and 95% of Americans would be covered. We're the only nation, industrial nation, that has a huge number of uninsured people. And that is more than a challenge, it's a crisis. So what we do here is to have an individual mandate, and I've heard all of the discussion about uh, the dangers of an individual mandate. In 93, 94, I remember it well, the linchpin of the Republican approach on health care reform was an individual mandate. Uh, we provide tax credits, and I want to talk about substance and not just focus on process. That's what we're here today to do. We have tax cre uh, credits to make this affordable for people. And we also then provide that if people will not pay, uh, provide insurance, there'll be a payment. We have employer responsibility in this bill, but, and this has been so misstated, uh, smaller businesses will be excluded altogether, and that's the vast majority of businesses. And we provide in this bill a tax credit to help small businesses cover people. So we have an individual mandate uh, helping people pay, and we have employer responsibility. As Mr. Waxman has suggested, uh, we begin to close the donut hole, the payments for, for prescription medicines by seniors, that was in the bill, this donut hole, that was passed by what is now the minority in this Congress. So we go beyond this. This is a fiscally responsible uh, set of uh, provisions. I think you know this. This bill extends the solvency of the trust fund for nine years. Of Medicare. Right. And CBO has told us, and I've read the literature that has come out, but CBO, which you like to quote when you agree with it, has said that uh, the first 10 years we're going to reduce the deficit 130 billion, and the next 10, well, 
I round it off. All right. I maybe round it off the wrong way. And 1.3 trillion, that rounds it off to over the next 10. And so let me just say a few words as I finish about how we pay for it. We have a Medicare health insurance tax, if you want to call it that, on people who have income over, take the family, 250000 And the tax is on the income over 250000 we, we take care of the overpayments uh, for the Medicare Advantage, overpayments, and what we do is to say we need a fiscally responsible Medicare Advantage program. We also have measures to control waste and abuse. There's an excise tax on health plans. We've debated it at length. People who say we haven't debated this bill, that it comes out of some sky or from under the ground. We've debated this uh, provision as we have all others regarding the tax on health care plans. Uh, we reduce it uh, by 80 percent. It was never, in my judgment, going to basically bend the curve. And I want to finish by talking about how we bend the curve in this proposal. We do it, and we talked at length about this within the Ways and Means Committee. We have pilot programs, and we've taken the lid off of pilot programs so that we can change the fee-for-service system. And I look around. Some of us know each other very well, <coughs> others less well. I don't know everybody's family history. I know my own. Our present system based on fee-for-service has to change. We can't do it overnight. <coughs> Pay based on volume instead of results has to change. And what is in this bill is the IPEB mechanism. It's controversial. But what it does is to put in place a structure so that we can have recommendations to this Congress as to how we change this system over time. And we retain in the Congress the ability, if we don't like the recommendations, to come up with our own that meet these targets. So those who say that this is a system that is based not not built on keeping what you have if you like it, <coughs> they're very wrong. Those who minimize the importance of covering 45 million Americans who don't have insurance, they're wrong. Those who say we're cutting Medicare benefits, they're wrong. What we're doing is cutting the increase in the payments to providers over time and if you challenge that, you're saying there's no waste in this system. We're not cutting Medicare benefits, period. And finally, what we're doing is putting in place a structure so over time we can change the system so people can keep their health care, people can get their health care, but people can afford their health care. That's what we're doing in this bill. And so I come here today urging that this committee make sure that we can have a structure. It's a fair structure, one that has been used before. There's nothing secretive about it, but something that allows this Congress, and I close with this, to step up to the plate and to do it successfully. My first entry into politics, as I remember it, was passing out leaflets for John Dingo's father. So I'm more than 40 years old. I remember it. Here we are, how many years later? John Dingo is here, carrying on for his dad. No president, no Congress has succeeded in making health care affordable and available to every American.
We're, we have a chance to do this today. We're on the edge. And I think this Congress and the President are willing to step up to the plate, and we should be allowed to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Levin. Mr. Camp? Thank <clears throat> I don't know how the... Is this on just, now? Just have it close. All right. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Dreyer and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this legislation today. The American people have spoken. They don't want the federal government involved in their personal health care, and they don't want a bill that spends over a trillion dollars, raises more than a half a trillion dollars in new taxes, cuts Medicare by more than a half a trillion dollars, and increases Americans' health insurance premiums. Yet that's exactly what will happen if the House passes the Senate Democrats' health care bill on the reconciliation bill tomorrow. The American people have rejected this bill precisely because it taxes too much, spends too much, <coughs> and increases premiums too much. With a total of $569.2 billion in new taxes, these bills represent the largest single tax increase in American history. Just what are those taxes? They are a first time ever tax on health care benefits, commonly referred to as the Cadillac tax, which raises taxes on the American people by $32 billion, but that will grow rapidly over the next decade. A new Medicare tax on wages, self-employment income, and certain investment income that increases taxes by $210.2 billion. A new tax on health insurance providers, which will undoubtedly be passed on to consumers in the form of higher premiums, and totals $60.1 billion. A new employer mandate tax that will crush small businesses, reduce wages, and kill American jobs by directly increases taxes, by directly increasing taxes on employers by $52 billion, and indirectly by much more as employers are forced to spend even more than they do today on health benefits even though unemployment is already near 10%. A new tax on drug manufacturers importers of $27 billion, which will be passed on to consumers. A new tax on medical device manufacturers and importers of $20 billion, which will also be passed on to consumers. New requirements on information reporting on payments to corporations that raises $17.1 billion a new higher floor for medical expense deductions for people with high medical bills that raises $15.2 billion in taxes, a new individual mandate tax which forces Americans to purchase health care they don't want and can't afford, or else pay this tax. This raises $17 billion, and an earlier analysis of this provision by the Joint Committee on Taxation said nearly half of that will be paid by Americans earning less than 300% of the federal poverty limit, which is $66,150 for a family of four. This, like many of the other provisions in this bill, and ones I've mentioned already, clearly violate the President's pledge that no family with an income less than $250,000 would pay higher taxes. There are also new limits on flexible spending accounts and cafeteria plans that raise $13 billion in new taxes. There's an elimination of the, of the deduction for expenses allocable to Medicare Part, the Medicare Part D subsidy in order to raise tax revenues by $4.5 billion. Other restrictions on health savings accounts, health reimbursement arrangements, and flexible spending accounts increase taxes by $5 billion. There's even a new set of taxes on tanning services to the tune of $2.7 billion, a limit to the deductibility of compensation paid to employees of certain health insurance providers that increases taxes by $600 million. And I realize to some that may seem a small number, but it was refreshing to mention one that was in the millions instead of the billions. But that's not all. There's a modification of Section 833 treatment of certain health organizations that raises $400 million in new taxes. These bills deny the use of the so-called black liquor for cellulosic biofuel produce, the producer credit, which raises $23.6 billion in tax revenues. There is codifying of the economic substance doctrine that increases taxes by $4.5 billion. And the Joint uh, Committee on Taxation tells us there are other quote-unquote revenue offsets to the tune of $60.3 billion. And again, 
these 20 different categories of tax increases total $569.2 billion. Now, these bills cut Medicare by nearly the same amount, a whopping $523.5 billion in cuts to a program that provides health care to our nation's elderly and the disabled. And the Senate proposed cuts that were 12 percent smaller in Medicare. The President's own Medicare actuaries predicted, and I'm quoting from their letter, that, quote, providers might end their participation in the program, possibly jeopardizing access to care for beneficiaries, end quote. But today we're being asked to send to the floor a bill that cuts even, cuts even deeper into Medicare and the help that it provides. Just what are these cuts? There are $202.3 billion in cuts to seniors' Medicare, Medicare health plans, including massive cuts targeting the extra benefits and reduced cost sharing seniors receive through Medicare Advantage. CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, predicted a similar policy would result in 4.8 million fewer seniors would be enrolled in these plans in 2019, while the Independent Medicare Advisory Commission predicted a similar policy would result in one in five seniors no longer being able to enroll in Medicare Advantage as a result of that policy. $156.6 billion in cuts to inpatient and outpatient hospital services, inpatient rehabilitation facilities, long-term care hospitals, inpatient psychiatric hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, ambulatory surgical centers, hospice, ambulances, dialysis facilities, labs, and durable medical equipment suppliers. $39.7 billion in cuts to the home health care providers. $22.1 billion in additional cuts to hospitals by slashing reimbursements designed to assist hospitals that serve low-income patients. $20.7 billion in cuts to the Medicare Improvement Fund, which had been intended to fund improvements to seniors' Medicare benefits, not to finance a new entitlement. $13.3 billion in the yet-to-be-determined Medicare cuts from the hands of an unelected federal board. $2.3 billion in cuts to imaging reimbursements when seniors have MRIs, CT scans, and other procedures. $800 million in cuts to power wheelchair suppliers. $65.7 billion in money taken from seniors in the form of higher premiums and additional cuts to Medicare beneficiaries and providers. The $569.2 billion in new taxes and the $523.5 billion in cuts to Medicare to fund a new entitlement program are unacceptable, especially when you consider these bills will increase the deficit once the cost of the Medicare doctor fix is factored in and, the increase the cost of health, and that will increase the cost of health insurance for all Americans. Simply put, the Democrats' bill will not only ruin our health care, but the tax increases will ruin our economy. Madam Chair, I'd like to close by just making a few simple requests. First, I urge you not to make these bills in order. They're deeply flawed, and they ought not to be brought to the floor for a vote. But second, if you insist on making them in order, I ask that you wait until we have the missing but very critical information that we need about them, such as the impact on health insurance premiums and national health care spending. With respect to both the Senate bill <laughs> and the one the House passed, the Congressional Budget Office agreed both would raise the cost of health insurance. And the Medicare actuaries agreed both would increase national health care spending. But today we're moving forward without the review and the written letter from the administration's, the President's own actuaries, the Medicare actuaries who are charged with evaluating the impact legislation like this would have on Medicare. So before we vote on these bills, I think we ought to know if the quote-unquote fixes that will be passed potentially in reconciliation have worked or if they've made the situation worse. And third, if you insist on moving this to the floor for possible consideration tomorrow, I request that you not use a so-called slaughter solution and instead allow a clear and clean vote on each measure. The American public deserves to know where their elected officials stand and not to have them hide behind a procedural vote. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Camp. Now we'll have the distinguished chairman of the Education Labor Committee, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Ranking Member Dreyer, members of the committee for affording us this time. Thank you for convening this meeting to consider the rule for H.R. 4872, the Reconciliation Act of 2010. 
I'm proud to join Chairman Spratt and my fellow uh, committee chairman and their subcommittee chairs, uh, along with my subcommittee chair, Rob Andrews, uh, to comment on the instructions the committee has given us for this historic legislation. In this reconciliation process, the Education and Labor Committee was the only committee to receive two instructions from the, on budget resolution. We were tasked with reporting reforms in both health care and education to reduce the deficit. I am pleased to report we met those instructions. The legislation under consideration takes a significant step toward ensuring affordability and greater access to both health insurance and higher education. My fellow chairmen have already highlighted some of the portions of the health care reform. Of these, I will focus my comments on employer responsibility and insurance reform. The health insurance reform legislation is good for business, good for jobs, and good for the economy. This legislation will lower skyrocketing premiums increases that allow American businesses to focus on what they do best, creating jobs and getting our economy moving again. The bill creates health insurance exchanges that will offer affordability, affordable health insurance to individuals, small businesses, and their employees. Although small employers with fewer than 50 full-time employees will be exempt from the bill's employer, employer responsibility requirement, the bill before you will provide significant tax credits to help them provide coverage for employees. For large employers, our reform gives them a choice. These employers can either provide affordable coverage for workers, or if their employees must go to the exchange and receive assistance to obtain insurance, these employers must make their fair contribution. This bill also ensures that insurance policy will be there for the family when they need it by guaranteeing long overdue protections. They include prohibitions on discrimination based upon pre-existing conditions, prohibitions on lifetime benefits, and into the retroactive policy rescissions. We allow families to keep their kids on their plans up, up to age 26, and many of these reforms will be effective this year. As I mentioned earlier, in addition to fixing our broken health care system, this bill also fixed our broken student lending system. It will make the single largest investment in financial assistance to families and students ever, at no cost to the taxpayers. It contains many provisions in the Student Aid and Fiscal Responsibility Act, which the House has already passed on bipartisan support. It will invest $36 billion in the Pell Grant program over 10 years. It will invest $750 million in improving college access and completion, support for students, including increasing financial literacy. It will also make federal loan repayments more affordable for graduates paying off their loan. The legislation also invests more than $2 billion in historical black colleges and, univer and universities and minority-serving institutions to help support those students. Finally, the bill invests over $2 billion in competitive grants for community colleges to, de to develop and improve educational career training programs. We are able to make these important investments by ending the wasteful subsidies given to the big banks and our, student and our current student loan programs. This notion is far from radical. These subsidies have been long identified as wasteful by President Clinton, by President George W. Bush. President Obama now has the courage to stop investing in corporate welfare for banks and start investing directly in our students and their families. By switching for, to the more reliable, cost-effective direct loan program, we'll save taxpayers $61 billion and cut the deficit by $10 billion. This reform will also preserve a strong role for private lenders. It will allow them to service 100% of the direct loans, which will ensure high-quality customer service for borrowers and protect jobs in the communities. In fact, moving to the direct loans will help keep jobs here in American soil. Unlike loans made by banks, loans lent directly through the government cannot be outsourced. In fact, the leading, the leading servicer of these loans repatriated 2,000 jobs as we started to move to the direct loan program a year and a half ago. So our forms will... Our reforms will end the practice of banks sending their loan servicing jobs out of the country. These reforms are good for taxpayers, they're good for jobs, and they're good for our economy, and they're good for students and their families. I urge, I urge all, all of our colleagues to support this historic legislation. It's time that we take decisive actions on behalf of Americans' middle class and we make this bill the law of the land. As we all have come to understand from visits with our constituents as we visit them every weekend, <coughs> health care costs are crushing our families, they're crushing businesses, large and small, and they're crushing our economy. They're, it, the system is broken, and it's unsustainable, and that comes from every sector of our economy and testimony before the Congress of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Now the ranking member of Education and Labor, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Madam Chair, and ranking member Dreyer, members of the committee. I really do always appreciate the opportunity to testify before this panel, yet I say to you with absolute conviction, I wish we were not here on this day and under these circumstances.
By now, the objections of my party and the American people to the underlying bill are well known. From the tax increases and Medicare cuts to the new mandates and federal intrusion, we all understand why the common shorthand for what's at stake is to call this a government takeover of health care. With only a few precious hours remaining before the final vote, I believe my time is best spent today talking about what the American people don't know already about. And unfortunately, there is plenty. In fact, it was the Speaker of the House who recently told an audience of local officials, quote, we have to pass the bill so that you can find out what's in it. Respectfully, I beg to differ. The American people deserve to know what's at stake long before legislation reaches the President's desk. Take, for example, the proposal to eliminate the largest single federal financial aid program, a public-private partnership used to finance and service millions of students' college loans each year. Most Americans would never have predicted such a proposal was on the table, much less that it would be included in a bill aimed at reshaping our health care system. This bill would force every college student and every college in America into a one-size-fits-all program and transform the U.S. Department of Education into one of our nation's largest banks. It takes a temporary problem, the need for increased federal financing of student loans in the face of a global financial crisis, and makes it permanent federal policy. This would put taxpayers on the hook for at least $100 billion a year in direct government lending, and likely much more as college costs continue to rise. That means, conservatively speaking, the U.S. government will take on an additional trillion dollars in long-term debt over the next decade. Debt we will owe to China and our other foreign creditors at a time when U.S. debts and deficits are already far too high. Students and schools were promised tens of billions of dollars if they were willing to swallow this plan to eliminate a popular financial aid program. Instead, CBO tells us nine billion of the 61 billion quote created by eliminating the student loan program will be siphoned from Democrats' promises of deficit reduction in education spending. In other words, Democrats are using the student loan program as a slush fund to pay for the unpopular health care plans. This appears to be a classic bait and switch, with students and schools forced to sacrifice a popular program and getting far less than the bargain that they bargained for in return. And it's not the only rude awakening for taxpayers. The bill posted to the Rules Committee website 48 hours ago includes another shady backroom deal modeled on the Cornhusker kickback and the Louisiana Purchase. This time, the Bank of North Dakota would remain in the more popular student loan program, even as it is abolished for every other student, school, and state in the nation. Call it the Bismarck Bank job. Media reports indicate the senator who secured the sweetheart deal has decided at the 11th hour the bad publicity is not worth the cozy benefit for his state. But we still have not seen a manager's amendment to strike this outrageous carve-out. A government takeover or health care system would be bad enough. Add to it a government takeover of student lending, and we quickly realize this legislation is not about doing what's right for American families. It's about expanding the size, scope, <coughs> power of the federal government. Madam Chair, I close by adding my voice to that of my colleagues to ask that you do not bring forth a deem and pass rule. Let's have a straightforward up or down vote on the Senate bill. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Klein. And now a member of the Budget Committee, Mr. Becerra. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. I don't think I'm going to give you a little the, It's on. It's on. Just make sure it's closed. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Dreyer. Appreciate your patience with us, and I appreciate the privilege to be here on behalf of Chairman Spratt and the members of the Budget Committee. Uh, rather than read into my testimony, testimony, which I will submit for the record, let me read to you what a couple of constituents of mine recently sent me. Eric wrote the following, I am a self-employed architect and pay monthly for a very expensive bottom line high deductible policy. My wife and I are covered, but our son had a stroke when he was eight years old. He is not insurable. Our coverage costs $750 per month. This is very expensive, beyond what we can afford, and it is there only as an emergency coverage. If we use the insurance, it immediately jumps in price. The last time we used it, it was a $250 per month increase in cost. If we incur another increase, we will have to drop the policy. Benjamin wrote and said, our insurance company retroactively canceled my wife's coverage after they had approved her to get an MRI. She was stuck with a bill that has taken three years to pay off. 
They scoured her record to find any mistake they could call on her, rather than foot a bill for a procedure they had approved for her to undergo. I do not consider this insurance. It is more akin to gambling. With passage of health insurance reform for America, Madam Chair, Eric will secure affordable health insurance for his son and his insurance company will be prohibited from gouging him and his wife through repeated premium increases and out-of-pocket cost increases. Had this health reform been in effect before, Benjamin and his wife would have saved three years of unscrupulous charges for that MRI treatment, and they could have invested their money in their family. Madam Chair, this week on Monday, the Budget Committee followed its instructions. It passed out the reconciliation bill that was provided for in concurrent resolution on the budget for fiscal year 2010, S con concurrent resolution 13. It included two reconciliation instructions as part of section 202, one for legislation on health care reform and the second for legislation investing in education. <laughs> Following the Budget Act's prescriptions that I've just mentioned for the Budget Committee's role in reconciliation, the Budget Committee took its action on this legislation and sent it to this committee, Rules Committee, authorizing you as members of the Rules Committee to report forward to the House of Representatives a reform for America that will once and for all, after failure by seven previous presidents, give Americans a chance to have quality, affordable health care. We have, Madam Chair, some of the best health care in the world. No one, for example, has better cancer survival, survival rates for their citizens than we in this country. But at the same time, there are 27 countries in the world that make sure that when a child is born in their country, that child will live to be at least one year of age. In fact, we are slightly ahead of Turkey and Mexico when it comes to infant uh, mortality rates. We are also, as the richest country of the world, with perhaps some of the best systems for healthcare, 24th in the world when it comes to the longevity of each and every one of us, our mortality rates rank behind 23 other countries in the world. Doing nothing is not a solution to this health care crisis. What we find are unsustainable rates and charges, not just to the federal government and its budget, but to the American taxpayer through the private for-profit insurance industry. We believe it's time to act. That is why this bill is before you. We are prepared to move forward. The Budget Committee sends to you this reconciliation package for your approval and vote and move to, moving to the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Macera. Mr. Uh, Mr. Bryan. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairwoman Slaughter, uh, Ranking Member Dreyer. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the Budget Committee reported out the reconciliation bill, but also, obviously, we realize it's going to appear in tandem with the Senate bill, so I want to address uh, both. Um, this legislation... <laughs> would produce a sweeping overhaul of our healthcare sector, about one-sixth of our economy. It will fundamentally change the relationship between patients and their doctors and put Washington in control of their health care. It will raise taxes by 56.9, 56, 569.2 billion. The number is so big, it's tough to even get your mind around it. It's going to raise taxes, $569.2 billion, just as the economy is struggling to get out of a recession and try to create jobs. It will add a new $2.4 trillion entitlement program on top of the fact that we already have $76 trillion in unfunded liabilities that we don't know how to pay for. Whether you share our opposition to this or you believe this bill should be enacted, I doubt there is any disagreement about the sweeping nature of this, legisla of this legislation or the convoluted process that's unfolding here. I'm sure the majority will cite cases of reconciliation ab abuse. Rules that package bills in one vote of Saturday sessions and Sunday votes. But you will not find the mix of abuse that will occur to gain enactment of this legislation. It is unprecedented. It is absolutely breathtaking. You in the room are the experts on the House rules. So I want to focus my comments on the extraordinary and unprecedented abuse of the budget reconciliation process. Budget reconciliation has been abused in the past. This is one of the reasons why the Senate adopted the so-called Byrd Rule. But reconciliation has never, ever been abused to the extent that it is today. Let's just think about what we're doing here. We are using last year's budget resolution, which has a target of $1 
billion dollars of deficit reduction reconciliation instructions to sweep into law a $2.4 trillion new entitlement. I mean, the DRA of 2006 was $40 billion. 1997 was something about $170 billion. So we now have before us a budget resolution that says, just find a token $1 billion, $1 billion in deficit reduction. Oh, and while we do that, why don't we create a new $2.4 trillion entitlement? We are not governing here today. We are greasing the skids to abuse the budget reconciliation procedure intended to control the government, not expand it. The key goal of the 1974 Budget Act, which is governing this process, was to rein in the president's power and give the Congress the means to control the budget. Today, the Budget Act is being used ironically by this president to jam through the largest expansion of entitlement spending in over 40 years. Let's take a quick look at the price tag. Everybody talks about the Congressional Budget Office. They're very good people. They are clearly being overworked. They do their jobs very well. But their job is to score what is put in front of them. Let me just talk about what's put in front of them. What has been put in front of them is a piece of legislation full of gimmicks. When you strip away the gimmicks, when you strip away the double counting and the faulty assumptions, it is clear that this overhaul does not reduce the deficit and it does not contain costs. I think the speaker kind of let the cat out of the bag yesterday when in her press conference she said, you know what, we are going to pass the quote unquote doc fix. So I asked the CBO, which they gave me a letter, which I would like to ask unanimous consent to put in the record. Objection. I asked the CBO, well, what is, what's the cost of this thing then if we do pass the doc fix as the speaker is claiming we will do? Well, right away, this wipes out the savings, the claim of $138 billion of deficit reduction and gives us a $58 billion deficit right there. CBO's letter yesterday shows us that. Now, I brought a chart, which I shrunk because it's a small room and it may be too big as well. So I'm sorry, Tom, if you don't mind. Let's take a look at the fuzzy math that's just inside this bill from looking at the letters we've gotten from CBO just yesterday and a few days before. They're claiming $138 billion of deficit reduction in this bill, and that's all the smoke and mirrors. But take a look at the Class Act. That's $70 billion of premiums, which are supposed to go to pay the benefit of the Class Act, but are instead being sequestered away to pay for this new entitlement. Then you got $53 billion of new Social Security taxes. When Social Security taxes come in, they're supposed to be reserved to pay more benefits. But again, you're just making more raids in the Social Security Trust Fund to pay for this new entitlement. And then the CBO tells us you're going to have to have a lot of money to run this program. $10 billion to the IRS to hire about 16,000 IRS agents to police the enforcement of this mandate on every American, about $55 billion just to go toward bureaucracies to run this new government takeover of health care, and just on the Part A trust fund, Part A trust fund, yesterday's CBO letter makes it extremely clear, all this money through these Medicare cuts is not going to extend the solvency of Medicare. CBO is extremely clear about that. It is going to pay for this new entitlement. Just from the Part A trust fund from Medicare, that's $398 billion coming from Medicare to go toward this new entitlement. You, looking at just the CBO letters we received, this bill over 10 years gives us a $454 billion deficit. Thank you. So it's very, very clear that when you strip away the gimmicks, when you look at the fact that this treats Medicare like a piggy bank to create new government programs, what we are doing here is we're imposing a new entitlement that we don't know how to pay for on top of the other entitlements we don't have money for. We're imposing job-killing tax increases on American people at a time we're trying to create jobs. And finally, let's just took a, take a look at the architecture of this legislation. It is designed to give the federal government control over what kind of health insurance is available for, more, for all Americans. It mandates Americans buy health insurance that is determined by the Secretary of HHS. It tells us how much health care is enough, and it tells us what treatments are worth paying for. I don't think this is what people send us here to do. And in the House, we are the people's house. We're up for re-election every other year. The entire body is up for re-election. The framers designed this institution to be closest to the people. And I would simply implore you, they want transparent government. They want accountable government. And bringing forward a rule that deems a 2,700-page bill a takeover of the entire healthcare sector, a creation of a $2.4 trillion new entitlement, 
deeming this in the law without actually having the courage to have a clean up or down vote in the people's house as representatives of the people is not good government. It's not democracy. One of the cornerstone principles of this nation that our founders created is that we have government by consent of the governed. That's not what's happening here. We are turning this principle on its head. And I would simply implore you, don't go down this path. Give us clean votes. And more to the point, the shame of all of this is, and many of you know this, especially my friends in Ways and Means, we've been offering ideas as well. We've been offering solutions. We have asked you to work with us on a bipartisan basis, step by step, piece by piece, work on the uninsured, work on those with pre-existing conditions, work on costs, work on prices, work on the deficit. Instead, I realize you have a big majority. I realize you have all the power in Washington. You chose to go it alone with one party rule. I just simply want you all to know that we too believe the current system in healthcare is unsustainable. It needs to get fixed. It is bankrupting families. It is bankrupting people with pre-existing conditions. We don't want to have 30 or 47 million uninsured, whatever number you choose, pick it. We want to fix this, but the answer is not to have the federal government take over the entire health care sector, impose $569.2 billion in new tax increases to kill jobs, and to raid Medicare by the tune of a total of $532 billion, not to extend its solvency, but to create a new entitlement. And so that is why we are opposed to this bill. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate all that. Mr. Ryan, I, um, I understand you have your own reform plan. Would you uh, just give us a very brief description of what you plan for Medicare? As I understand it, you phase it out. Sure. Uh, you get rid of it completely. No, far, farthest from the truth. I couldn't uh -huh. disagree with you more. But uh, let me first say there are lots of Republican bills on health care. There are dozens of bills. Mr. Camp but has a bill. Mr. Price has a bill. you're budget, so yours so obviously is very important. Actually, I have, that's not the Republican budget. I introduced my own long-term okay. entitlement well, plan. let's hear about it. And I'll just tell you what it does for Medicare because okay. that's what you asked me. What I say is, we realize that Medicare is a $38 trillion unfunded liability. That's today. If we wait till 2014, it's a $52 trillion unfunded liability. Mm -hmm. It's quickly going bankrupt. Medicare goes bankrupt by 2017. And so what my bill does, which has been scored by the actuaries at Medicare as achieving full solvency, which has been scored by the Congressional Budget Office as achieving permanent solvency to the Medicare program, is I say this. If you're in or near retirement, if you're over the age of 55, we're not going to change a thing for you in Medicare. You're going to get the Medicare that you have organized your life around. You're grandfathering the so people. So we're not but saying. What happens to so them? let me just finish, if you might, if I might, Madam Chairman. We're not saying we're going to cut Medicare by 532 billion dollars, what this bill does. We're not saying, like the actuary is telling us, we're going to have one out of five Medicare providers go out of business or drop their patients. We're saying we want you to have the Medicare you have right now. And then if you're under 55, if you're mm -hmm. like me in the X generation. It's not going to be there for us. We already know the program's going bankrupt in seven years. So, it so I say, under your let's, let's reform Medicare to make it sustainable. And the kind of reform I propose is to have the kind of health care that we as members of Congress have. What I get as a member of Congress is I get a payment, and then I get a book Mr. Ryan, from the federal government. Medicare if we and so for that, that's what I'm saying. No, what I really no, I know. You want, me to, you want me to explain that, to you what my well, Medicare reform is, let, right? May I please I'm just ask? I'm sorry. I was just explaining. I was answering your question. You were asking me what my the Medicare reform does. The question I want to know, and that I really started with, is your aim is to phase out Medicare. No, that's not true, and that's why, I, that's why I'm trying to answer you your question. Did you not say that if you were below 55 now, that, it, that Medicare would not be there? That's right. Medicare is going bankrupt. Medicare is running out of money. Well, I is it $38 our trillion dollar unfunded liability? So let exactly. me explain to you what I propose. As I mean, I Madam Chair, are you going to get? Can I answer your question? Of course. I, okay. I hope you will. So I what I'm proposing is yes. for people under the age of 55, we transform the Medicare system to a system that works like what we have in Congress. We get a payment. Vouchers. We get a payment just oh. like we have in Congress. And what we get with that payment, you can call it a voucher, whatever you want, uh -huh. we get to pick among a list of pre-certified Medicare plans, just like we do in Congress, to pick our benefit. But I do three things to that payment. If you're low income, we're going to cover all of your out-of-pocket costs. If you're sick and if your health condition deteriorates, you're going to get more money to make sure you can get affordable care. And if you're wealthy, because you're wealthy, you can afford more of it, so I means test the benefit. What that does is it gives everybody who goes into Medicare, people younger than 55, when they turn 65, it gives them the kind of a benefit just like we have in Congress with additional support for the sick and additional support for low-income people. Doing it that way by giving competition, 
by having plans compete against each other for our business, according to the actuaries at Medicare, according to the Congressional Budget Office, makes the program permanently solvent. It, Medicare still continues. It is still an entitlement. It is still a Medicare system for all, for everybody over the age of 65, but it is and done in a way that is sustainable. It is done in a way that actually pays off our nation's debt. Well, as I understand it, and what you're well, telling me... I can me, tell you don't uh, understand well, it accurately. Hold on a minute here. <laughs> What you're saying is that in the future, the elderly will be given a voucher, the elderly, the mentally ill, the critically ill, all these people that are covered now by Medicare will be given a voucher to go to the public market. Is that No, I'm correct? saying they'll it's be not, given a payment and they'll have a list of pre-certified Medicare plans. A voucher. Medicare, just like it does for you and I. They go by their own insurance if they can find it. Medicare approved insurance. I see. Well, I, I, I think that <coughs> I know you don't like the plan. Cruelty, That's Ms. fine. Ma Madam Chair, I understand you don't like the plan, but I would ask you then, where, what's your well, plan? I'll, I'll tell you what What is your plan, plan to is. fix what, this? Let me, we've got our plan. This isn't one, a Medicare plan. This, one this of the, actually hurts Medicare. One of the major differences as well that I want to discuss with you is that this plan that we are proposing to vote on tomorrow covers 95% of all Americans. You're talking you, about the under 65 population. You, you are going to cover, I think, was it 3 million more people? We plan to cover, I think, about 32 million. You're going to do 3 million. You're talking about a different bill. You're not talking about my bill. I believe we are. No, you're not. You're talking right. about a different bill. Well, then let me ask. You're talking about, I have a bill that, that gets it toward universal me, coverage. Um, there are lots of different Republican bills. Mr. Becerra, I think you wanted to comment. <coughs> Madam Chair, I hope we get back to talking about the bill that will be passed for the American public, but I think it's important to recognize that Mr. Ryan's plan is out there. It is in legislative language. What we do find is that he will eliminate Medicare as we know it for anyone who is 55 or younger. They will, as you said, maybe Paul doesn't want to call it a voucher, but it will essentially be a ticket, a ticket that loses value every year because it doesn't keep up with the cost of medical inflation that seniors who are hoping that in retirement they can afford to have insurance, health insurance will find it more and more difficult to do. But more than that, what I think we should examine more closely, those of us who are not yet receiving Medicare, is the fact that this uh, Republican uh, proposal by Mr. Ryan raises taxes on 90 percent of Americans to try to help pay for the cost of his proposal. That's because he will tax employee benefits that currently people who have their insurance through their employer receive. And so what we have fought so vigorously to avoid is a tax on every single American who works today and receives his or her insurance through his employer. Mr. Ryan's proposal would tax and tax heavily. And so there are ways that he pays for his plan and we should examine those. There are ways that well, he changes tell us the what they are. Well, as I said, he to, to find a way to pay for the plan, uh, Mr. All Ryan will, will tax each and every American. 180 million Americans today receive their coverage but through their employer. They, your, will, they will face a tax under Mr. Ryan's plan. In your opinion, his plan does away with Medicare and leaves people with a voucher to go out and try to find their own Medicare coverage. Medicare as we know it. Correct? Madam Chair, can we know I comment is, on that? Is yes, removed. Yes, yes, you may. Look, it's very easy to, it's very easy to find savings by essentially, instead of guaranteeing everybody coverage like we do today under Medicare, give them a voucher, and the difference between what is the cost of Medicare and the, the value of the voucher, all you have to do, you can make it lower, lower, and you save more, but you undermine health care for all people who are seniors. The basic premise of Medicare is that every senior is guaranteed health care. Mr. Ryan's proposal does not guarantee it does. every... It doesn't. It, does. it doesn't. It well, doesn't. And, and, well, okay, let me... I've got to... Purely, purely... Madam Chair, it guarantees. No, obviously we disagree on that. Yes, but Mr. Ryan, obviously we disagree on that, and, and I realize you want to talk about somebody else's bill than your own legislation. That's, Audio, that's, abundantly, that's abundantly clear to me right now. We're glad to talk about ours. Let me say two things. Let me say two things. First off, I find it interesting that you're saying we're growing the, the increase uh, slower than health care expenses. That's exactly what you're doing in this legislation. One, you have two things that you claim bends the cost curve in this bill. And you just put this in the reconciliation bill, which is your subsidy for Americans in the exchange slows down in the out years to try and get savings. So you yourself are 
are basically saying we want to do the same thing. So you want to slow down. We want to slow down. We want to slow down the subsidies mm -hmm. at a lower rate than health inflation. You do that as well. Number two, taxing health insurance benefits. You're taxing health insurance benefits in this bill, but in, unlike my plan, you're taxing them to go to a creation of another government program. I'm saying to Americans, we're going to take this tax benefit and delink it from your job and give it to you. So that tax money doesn't go to the government for a new program like you're doing. The tax money says, look, if you got laid off, if you work for yourself, you're going to get the same kind of tax benefit that everybody gets when they work for a job. We are discriminating against people who do not have health insurance from their jobs. And so I'm saying, instead of having a tax benefit tied to your job, let's attach it to individuals. So it's not a tax increase. It's an exchange of a tax benefit of one for the other. I know you want to talk about other people's bill than this legislation. I'm only simply saying you've endorsed those two concepts in this legislation alone. And so let's try and all be consistent if we could. I think Mr. Andrews wants to address that. Madam Chair, if I, if I, well, I, didn't, if I could have the prerogative for a moment to talk about our bill and ask Mr. Ryan about a difference between our bill and his. Use the microphone, please. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, yeah, Madam Chair. Uh, Congressman Andrews from New Jersey, subcommittee chair of the HELP subcommittee. Thank you. Uh, let's take a, a person who drives a truck and makes $50,000 a year, whose health insurance plan is worth $18,000. Is that person taxed under our plan? Under your plan, that person, well, let me see, $50,000 in what year? The answer is no. Okay, because <laughs> you're taxed. <laughs> Yeah, the $18,000. In 2018. That person. In 2018. On their health benefits, there are plenty of other taxes That's in this correct. bill that hits Not that person. No, no, on their health benefits. Is that person taxed under your plan? No, that person gets an average tax cut of $1,400. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Because, no, a refundable oh, a tax credit. Are, are there. A refundable are there, tax credit. I can, I've, I've run these numbers, Robin. You know I know this stuff. And we're not here on Mr. Ryan's bill. And I'd like to just get back to our bill. I would like to get a tax cut under my I would like to. Under your plan, it, the person gets a tax. Are the health benefits of that truck driver taxed? Are yes, they? and he Thank gets you. a cash benefit of fifty-seven hundred dollars, which is more than okay. he gets right now under the current Madam code. Chairman, Chairman I, I, I'm pleased to be here, but if we're going to have debate back and forth between witnesses, uh, and I think it's so important, frankly, Mr. Waxman, that we have some <laughs> idea of, of, of the bill that's. Uh, Okay, well, let's, let's do this, but it seems to me that it's hey, getting a little bit out this. of control. Why don't we just pass my proposal and then we'll be all... Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. You're, let's just do that. Give yeah. him a vote on it. Yeah. Your proposal Put would shift up. the costs onto the elderly, what, people when they get to be elderly, and that's how the government will save money. But I think most Americans want Medicare to be there when they're eligible for it. It's going to be $38 just a trillion minute. on fundamental liability. Medicare, wait a second. And Medicare is, an, is a benefit that you're entitled to after you've paid in all those years, what you would do is take it away from the next generation and say to them, here's a sum of money, go out and buy a private insurance policy. If you can afford to put in more, you'll get more. If you can't, you'll get something. You'll get the poor people's HMO. But that is not what we want for Medicare, and I don't think that's what the American people want. But that's not up tomorrow. Our bill that's up tomorrow would extend Medicare, make that trust fund more solvent for a longer period of time, it would close the donut hole on people paying for their prescription drugs. It would make uh, preventable benefits uh, without co-pays. That means we'll keep people healthier longer. That's keeping the promise of Medicare. You want to change the promise, it's a different philosophy. But uh, I, I interrupted Mr. Andrews. I, I, I think he had to say what he has to say. And then uh, uh, rather than use the, uh, he's not a member of the panel to question witnesses. Thank you very much. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Uh, let me, let me uh, thank all of you and say that we've been joined by Tom Price, who's here as uh, Mr. Klein had to leave, and to, and to make, um, make the point that it was the distinguished chair of the Committee on Rules who asked Mr. Ryan to discuss his plan. It's not what he came here to talk about, although he, of course, is very proud of his work product. And, uh, and I think that, that what we've just seen here, Madam Chair, is that uh, this is the most compelling argument for an open and freewheeling and transparent debate on the floor of the House of Representatives. We have the chairs and the ranking members of the four committees that have been working diligently on this issue for a long period of time. And uh, I think that the idea, as Mr. Barton began discussing and pointed to so well, and Mr. Camp supported him in this effort, as have the other 
uh, members uh, representing the minority who have been here. It, it is essential that in what was promised as the most transparent and open Congress in the history of the Republic, that we, on this issue, which everyone acknowledges is landmark legislation, that we have that kind of open debate that we were promised at the beginning of the last Congress and the beginning of this Congress. Now, what I'd like to do is just take a, a brief moment to touch on what both Sandy Levin and what Javier Becerra raised. That is the, the very important personal aspect of this. Sandy Levin was handing out flyers for John Dingell's father, um, reminding all of us that we're not quite as old as he is, but uh, Joe Barton, by pointing to those of us who are senior to him, was reminding all of us how much older we are than he is. But the fact is, what was being done there uh, to focus on this issue and make sure that people have access to health care is a, a very important thing. Javier Becerra talked about two instances of Californians who would be neighbors of, of mine, since Javier and I are neighbors, and, and the challenge that they face. And there's a sense that, while going all the way back to Teddy Roosevelt, president after president, Democrat and Republican, as President Obama has said, have been trying to deal with this. And my friend, Mr. McGovern, regularly says uh, on the House floor that we as Republicans, when we were in the majority, did absolutely nothing. We ignored this issue. And I'd like to disabuse people of that notion by pointing to uh, a couple of, of issues and uh, recognizing that we could go a long way towards increasing the number of Americans who will have access to health insurance. <coughs> and I've got to say that I think that in light of the argument that we've made, Mr. Camp and Mr. Barton and Mr. Klein and Mr. Ryan made, which I share of the diminution of the economic growth that we are enjoying with that $569.2 billion, half a trillion dollar tax increase that will slow economic growth, I am very hard pressed to believe that we will see health insurance made available for 32 million Americans. And that our proposal will only make health insurance available for 3 million Americans. I just don't accept that notion. Because if we, well, but if we, if we actually see a diminution of the economic growth in this country, the resources will not be there. And so what I'd like to say is that in response to this argument that we have not consistently been working on this issue, point to just a couple of things. First of all, I'm very proud of the fact that we initiated 23 years ago the existence of medical savings accounts. And those have played a role in increasing the access uh, to health insurance for people in this country. And I know that the argument put out there that incentivizing people uh, through taxes is, is not possible for those who are at the lower end of the economic spectrum, but we have been able to increase that access. I'm also very proud of the fact that there are seniors today who have access to affordable prescription drugs because of the Part D program that we put into place. But there are a couple of other issues that the President has actually said that he's supported in the, in the health care summit that a number of you participated in. And uh, there are issues that we, when we were in the majority, actually sent to the United States Senate, and unfortunately they were blocked. One is associated health plans. <laughs> and this is something, again, that the President has said that he is supportive of. This notion of trying to allow small businesses to come together so that they'll have an opportunity to have lower rates. When we were in the majority, we sent legislation to do just that to the United States Senate, and unfortunately, it was blocked. It was blocked by the Democratic minority at that time. And the second issue to go hand in hand with that, Madam Chair, is the issue of real meaningful lawsuit abuse reform. When the President of the United States addressed us in the joint session of Congress, he said that he was supportive of doing that. And um, guess what? When we were in the majority, we very proudly worked on that in a bipartisan way, sent it to the United States Senate, and the Democrats in the Senate <coughs> blocked that. And so while it is true for decades and decades there have been efforts being made to try and ensure that more Americans have access to quality health insurance, we have tried and will continue to try. And I will argue that <coughs> If we're successful at killing this legislation, defeating this legislation, by the way, the only thing bipartisan about this legislation will be those who are in opposition to the legislation. If we are successful, Madam Chair, in doing that, 
I'm convinced that <coughs> Monday morning we'll be able to come together to not only work on real lawsuit abuse reform and associated health plans, but we can expand medical savings accounts. We can create an opportunity for pooling to deal with the very important pre-existing conditions that the two individuals that Mr. Becerra mentioned um, are, are there. And we all know another <coughs> thing the President has indicated that he supports is the notion of allowing for the purchase of insurance products across state lines. Those are five simple things that I believe we can work on in a bipartisan way. The only way that we're going to be able to do that, to ensure that we can, by the way, immediately, immediately, not in 2014, but immediately drive the cost of health insurance down, is to defeat this bill. And we'll have an opportunity, I know, later to get into the process. And I thank all of you for pointing to this process, which does clearly undermine the kind of openness that we were promised. But we will, Monday morning, do everything that we can to make sure that more Americans do have access to quality health insurance. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dreyer, Mr. McGovern. Uh, uh, Mr. Levin. Mr. Mr. Levin. Well, maybe, maybe you should go on. And, and I very much respect. It's hard to tell from the light when this is on and when it's off. It's on? It's quite all right. It's fine. Okay. Just make sure you speak in. Um, it's like the mics at Ways and Means Committee. Unidirectional. <laughs> Whatever it is. Um, good. I, I very much respect uh, the, the sentiment, Mr. Dreyer, but what has come before the Ways and Means Committee on two of the issues, and there are many more, uh, no proposal came before us from the Republican minority that would cover more than three million people. That's just a fact. And in terms of pre-existing conditions, no proposal came before us that would address this basic issue. No Republican proposal came before our committee. So I, I understand the sentiment. And you were in control for lots of years. And while you were in control, the number of uninsured grew and grew and grew. And the number of people who were penalized for for pre-existing conditions. That number grew and grew. And the inability to get control of health care costs while you were in control, that inability has grown and grown. Well, let me just say, again, and, there and, were proposals. There were proposals that we tried to pass in a bipartisan but not, way. But, not on, but, but not on those. Well, you're talking about when we were in the majority. And so I just want to say that we tried to do that and Obviously, as we have gone through this process, it has been a difficult one, and it has not been the most open and transparent. Okay, let me just finish. None of them touched the issue of coverage of 45 now million people. I'm, I'm shown one in four in California lack health insurance. In Michigan, it's over a million people don't have health insurance, and we're going to do something about it in terms of pre-existing conditions. Nothing that you proposed was going to address that issue. And what I said is that what I said is that the five issues that I've raised dealing with pre-existing conditions, creating greater competition to drive the cost of those policies of those premiums down is something that I believe will happen immediately if we were to pass legislation. So, so vote for our bill and it will happen. We can do that. No, no, no. In 2014. Vote for our bill. Maybe in 2014. No, we start we maybe start pre-existing conditions with maybe children right away. Right away, in six months, right away we take care of that right problem. I mean, Mr. Dreyer, could I, sure. could I comment as Absolutely. well, since this is our committee? Well, first of all, we actually, for the first four years of your bill and our bill, have pretty similar treatment of pre-existing conditions because we use high-risk pools and, and right. the like. And, yeah, and we, we differ, we differ no, excuse when... Me, excuse me, excuse if me. I could Mr. Just, Levin just said there was no proposal to deal with pre-existing conditions, and now you have just... No, I said effective yeah. proposal. But, oh, effective proposal. But yeah, if I could just complete the thought... No, no, right, um, right. Well, I mean, I mean, I just, it was in response to this notion that there was no proposal whatsoever. No effective proposal. Now that there is. But, but we, we have taken a different approach than the Democrats. There's no doubt about that. They want to do one big bill that tries to do all these things at once, and we felt that we should follow on the path that we had passed, as you mentioned, with HSAs and... Uh, you know, Part D and putting wellness in Medicare and all of the step-by-step -step approaches that really, I think, made sense. And the real problem with their approach is premiums go up. And the reason people lose their insurance and don't have insurance 
is because they can't afford it. And if you look at the Congressional Budget Office score of the Senate Democrats bill, premiums go up about 13% in 2016. Now, we don't have a CBO score of this so-called reconciliation bill because they haven't had time to do it, and the Democrats are not going to give them time to give us the, the information as to whether or not premiums are going up. So we have no information there. We won't have and, hours and let me just either. And let me just touch again on this coverage issue. Half of their coverage comes from expanding Medicaid. We know that that is a program that is not sustainable in the long term, and we know that what they had to do was cut special deals with states to get people to go along with it. And so what they did then is extend the federal share of uh, Medicare to everybody so that this was a match program, part paid by the states, part paid by the federal government. But if anybody thinks the federal government is continue to pay 100% pay of Medicaid off into the future, so what, they're, they're obviously not being very realistic about this program. So at huge cost, in a program that needs reform, that is unsustainable, they're expanding. And they do that by, obviously, these huge tax increases we mentioned and the reductions in the Medicare program. So uh, there is another way to do this. And I think the way could have been forward uh, with this uh, a, small, a, a smaller approach, begin to address the issue of cost, bring costs down in health care, begin to address the issue of expanding coverage, as we did to millions of people in our bill. And then we could move forward on, on, on that once we begin to get costs out of health care. Mr. Kemp, you know in reconciliation there is no special deal on Medicaid. You know that. Well, the special deal is no, there's that, no, there's, that, there's you, no. that the federal government is paying 100 percent of Medicaid, I think, for don't, four don't years. Don't call that a special deal. Call that a good deal for coverage of people with health care. Madam Chair, let me just say, good, let, let me, let me, let me just say that it's, uh, it's 11.30 now, and we've been going for an hour and a half. That is 50 percent longer than the entire debate time that will be allowed, not on the legislation, but simply on the special rule that will be brought to the floor for consideration of this. And I think that what we've seen here demonstrates very, very clearly that we should be having an open and transparent debate on the House floor on this issue. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. McGovern. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I want to thank all the witnesses for being here. And um, uh, I appreciate the tone that, uh, that you have brought to this debate. Um, and I know that all of you, uh, in including my Republican colleagues who I disagree with, are very serious about trying to uh, approach this legislation. Um, let me begin by saying a couple of words about the process. Um, the fact is that uh, this has been an open and transparent process. Um, I don't know of any other legislation that has received as much scrutiny uh, as this legislation has. Uh, we have, um, President Obama began the process with, with a health care summit at the beginning of 2009. Republicans and Democrats were there. They participated. And over the past year and a half, the House held nearly 100 hours of hearings and 83 hours of committee markups. We heard from over 181 witnesses both Democrats and Republicans, 239 amendments were, were considered and 121 were adopted. Uh, the notion that somehow there wasn't a process in place uh, is absurd. Um, we're now in a difficult situation because the Republicans, uh, the Republican leadership, I should say, uh, has, has made it their mission to use every, every parliamentary maneuver and trick available to, uh, to try to block this legislation. As the chairwoman said before, you know, we, we can't have a regular conference because the uh, minority leader in the Senate has said he would invoke the filibuster to try to prevent the appoint, appointment of conferees. So, I mean, if you want to talk about an outrageous process, it's the way some of the Republican leadership has abused this process. Um, and w the, one of the things about this bill is it also addresses another outrageous process, and that is the process that many insurance companies utilize when they deny people uh, the right to uh, become part of a, a health insurance plan, when there are people who are literally on their way to the operating room and they're, they're notified that they will not be covered for a procedure. I mean, there is a lot of abuse uh, in the insurance in industry. There are good insurance companies and there are bad insurance companies. Uh, and Mr. Dreyer talks about all the great initiatives that the Republicans had. Well, you were in charge for a long time. Not much has changed. I mean, the fact of the matter is, as Mr. Levin pointed out, there are tens of millions of Americans right now who don't have insurance. 
Uh, there are countless people who are discriminated against because they have pre-existing conditions. And, and some of the pre-existing conditions are outrageous. People have been denied insurance because they have a bad case of acne. Um, in some states, domestic violence uh, can be considered a pre-existing condition. A woman who gets beat up by her husband or her boyfriend um, has a pre-existing condition and can't get uh, health insurance? That's insane. That's nuts. I mean, I, that has to change. That didn't change, uh, Mr. Dreyer, for all the years you were uh, in control. But we're going to try to change it now. We're, 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 no, well, we're going to try to change it now. Um, the fact, you know, we, the fact of the matter is that I think we're on the cusp of making history. You know, um, my, uh, Ted Kennedy, I'm from Massachusetts. Ted Kennedy got elected to the Senate in 1962 and said, you know, he's going to fight to make sure that everybody in this country has health care. Uh, 1972, my old boss, the former chairman of the Rules Committee, Joe Moakley, ran for Congress, um, and his slogan was that vote for me and I'm going to help Ted Kennedy get everybody insurance. When I ran for Congress in 1996, I said, I'm going to help Joe Moakley and Ted Kennedy get everybody insured. You know, um, well, I think tomorrow, uh, if this, when this bill gets brought up, um, we will have that opportunity uh, to fulfill their dreams. I only wish they were here to, to, to see it and to witness it. Uh, but what we're trying to do here is ensure 32, addition, 32 million additional Americans. We want to provide them more choices, more protections. Uh, uh, than they have right now. I mean, uh, every American should have what members of Congress have. They should have the choices and the protections that we have. And that's what this bill is about. Uh, we want to control costs for small businesses. I mean, I think every one of us here gets, get, has gotten calls from small business men and women who say that they would like to expand the number of employees they have, but they can't because the cost of insurance is so high. This bill has some subsidies and some relief for small businesses and individuals who can't afford insurance, that's a good thing. Uh, we want to extend the life of Medicare. Um, you know, uh, and, you know, and I don't want to go back into the, to the uh, Mr. Ryan's uh, budget alternative, but I mean, I think what the chairwoman was pointing out is that there is a philosophical difference, I think, between Democrats and Republicans on the issue of Medicare. Um, we don't want to go to a voucher system. We don't want to privatize it. We don't want to privatize Social Security either. Uh, so there are philosophical differences, and those are worth debating on the floor. Reduces the, uh, the deficits. You know, um, in contrast, quite frankly, to the prescription drug bill that was brought up to the Rules Committee at midnight um, when my friends in the Republican Party were in charge. Um, and uh, it wasn't paid for. Judd Gregg, Senator Judd Gregg, Republican, says, and I quote, Part D added a $8 trillion unfunded liability to the federal deficit. Um, I mean... You know, we're paying for our bill here. Uh, not only are we paying for it, but according to CBO, we're going to reduce the deficit by well over a trillion dollars. Um, I think that's a good thing. Um, and I think it's a courageous thing that we are actually putting this together and, uh, and, uh, and bringing it before the floor. Um, I am, um, you know, I... I you know, for the, for, you know, for many years when my friends on the other side were in charge, um, I mean, their prescription for health care was essentially take two tax breaks and call me in the morning. Um, it didn't work. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the Bush tax cuts alone uh, added six, $1.6 trillion to the debt in the first 10 years. So when you want to talk about deficits and debt, um, you know, this is one way to get it. You have to control health care costs. You know, this is 16 or 17 percent of our GDP is health care. We're told if we don't do anything in the next decade or so, it, could get, you know, it rises and rises up to the point where it could get to 50 percent of our GDP. That's unsustainable. I mean, we are spending an awful lot of money, and we're not getting the biggest bang for our buck. Everybody in this country should have access to good quality health insurance. You know, nobody in this country should be discriminated against because of pre-existing conditions. We need to figure out a way to control costs so that individuals and small businesses can, can afford it. And that's what this attempt is about here. And there are philosophical difference and differences and ideological differences. I get it, and we'll debate it. But I'll tell you, and I want to commend the chairwoman, and I want to commend the speaker. I mean, the, 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 the goal here was to have a transparent and open process. I think we, I think we did that. We're, we're running into a situation now where the Republican leadership is trying to block this. So I don't know what the rule is going to be, but the fact of the matter is, I think people are tired of us giving speeches, and they're tired of the, of the rhetoric 
and they're tired of the excuses. What they want is action. And my hope is that tomorrow we'll have action, and I look forward to uh, speaking on this bill and, and voting for it. And I, I, I think this is an historic moment, and <coughs> I'm very proud of everybody who participated in this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGovern. Mr. Daz Ballard. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I thank all of our distinguished colleagues for uh, coming before us and their presentations uh, this morning. Um, I think substantively there's been a, a summary of, of uh, the proposals that has uh, been able to uh, be heard by virtue of the contrast of opinions uh, and the discussion that we've had. Uh, I, I thank uh, Mr. Barton for emphasizing uh, the issue of, uh, of process. Uh, we are the process committee. Uh, and. And I guess the, the question that I would have for, for uh, our distinguished friends, uh, the chairman, who are here, uh, has to do with uh, uh, when I, I recall when, has to do with, with process. Because when I recall when we passed, attempted to pass the line item veto, that um, the, the Supreme Court said if the president, before he signs a bill, changes it in any way, even by taking out one line. Uh, it's, uh, it's not the same bill that was passed by the House, by the Senate, and thus signed. So um, if, if we do deem the Senate bill passed in a rule, obviously then there will be some additional words. Um, how, how do you overcome, how do you overcome the, uh, the requirement of exact language, uh, Mr. Waxman? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I was one of the uh, plaintiffs in the lawsuit that knocked out the uh, line item veto for the president. It was locked out because it was a, a delegation of authority to the Congress, that, uh, to the president that the Congress has. The Congress has the obligation to pass the law, and the president can sign it or veto it, not selectively pick out what he would veto. The situation here is different. Uh, we're not going to deem the Senate bill passed. We're going to pass the Senate bill. That's, that, we're going to pass it by a vote of the House. That is the way a bill becomes a law. I, you'll figure out how to do the rule. But when you establish the rule, we'll be required to vote for the rule. We'll be required to vote for the amendments. And an amendment will have to be approved before it's carried. The rule will have to be approved before it's approved. That's the way we operate. I would be against the idea of deeming something. We either pass it or we don't pass it. And I think the rule ought to say that we pass this when we vote to do this, we pass that when we vote to do that. And uh, that's uh, the way we resolve that. And, and I, Mr. Barton. Well, I just want to, I hope we're making news here. I hope that what Chairman Waxman just said, the Rules Committee is going to pass a rule that gives us a vote on the Senate pass bill. Is that what you're saying? Well, I if it is, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> of course we're going to vote. To so we're going to have... Bill. You, don't, you have to have a vote. Now, the Rules Committee can, as all Rules Committees have done under Democrats and Republicans, fashion what goes in and what goes out when there's a particular uh, vote that's before Well, Henry us. Waxman and I are together to on this. We're like twins. If, if Chairman Waxman is now saying he's going to insist or request a rule that gives us a vote up and down on the substance of the Senate passed bill, that is news. That's, 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 not a self-executing rule, not a rule that deems, no, it's not the same. It's not the same, Mr. Miller. It is not the same. I, 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 we, Mr. Diaz Ballard has the. Uh, yes. Uh, you, you've got two separate issues. Excuse me. I would love to question all of you. Uh, I think we're no, making progress. No, we have a 2,700 page Senate bill, and we have a large reconciliation bill. They're two different pieces of legislation. Okay, so, and you're going to have a vote on a rule, number one, and then if you do what Chairman Waxman just said, you're going to have a vote on the Senate pass bill, number two, that, right? and if that passes, then you're going to have a vote on the reconciliation well, bill, number three. He, he didn't well, say that. If you don't do it that way, it's a subversion of the process. It isn't. Oh, well, well, Mr. Becerra, do you have a point? Uh, Mr. Disbelart, uh, thank you for raising the point, because we have to go through a process to do policy. And so to respond... 
what we are doing is we are passing a legislative package, which you know, having sat on the Rules Committee for so many years, and many of my, every one of my colleagues here who sits as chair or ranking member knows that we often put together a package of proposals into one bill that is passed on the floor. I give you the, the example that I've heard from some of my colleagues to best explain this. You have purchased a house, I have purchased a house. When you make an offer on a house, you have now signed a contract that says you will buy that house. You typically ask for a, a contingency, an inspection contingency. You want to take a look at that house and have an inspector who can tell you if there's anything wrong. Inspector comes back and says, guess what? You didn't know it, but that roof is leaking pretty badly. You say, I still am going to buy that house because I signed on the dotted line, but you have to fix the roof or give me money so I can fix the roof because it wasn't obvious. You then have the roof fixed or money provided to you as the buyer to fix the roof and you finish the deal. That is exactly what we're doing in this legislative process. The ha Senate passed a bill. We are taking that bill. We are going to pass that bill. We're going to pass it by making the corrections, fixing the leaky roof with this, these, these corrections, uh, this correction bill called the reconciliation but bill. You, that will pass as a package. I know, but you know that if in that rule, that vehicle by which the Senate bill is passed, that then becomes law, is sent to the president. The other contingencies or remedies uh, are to be sent to the Senate. So, well, they may be passed, they may not be passed. I, what I wanted to bring That's out, correct. because I think it would be ironic, I think it would be ironic uh, if this signature issue, this landmark legislation of this president and this majority it's going to reach the Supreme Court on the issue that I thought I, in, in, in a, a Clinton versus City of New York is, is clear. If there's any change whatsoever, even one word uh, in, in legislation in any of the three facets, uh, it's, it doesn't satisfy the test. And that, how ironic it would be if your signature issue no. is thrown out. At, at Mr. Dizbalart, that's the same as that house. If you believe you purchased a house and all of a sudden you find out you bought a shack instead, you're going to be very well, upset. Uh, could, could, could I answer that? Senate bill. Could I answer? Of course, sir. If, answer? I just, if I could just finish. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were doing. We are passing the Senate bill. The president will have that that he gets to sign and make law. We are passing in this package a reconciliation bill that includes the, uh, the corrections to the Senate bill that go to the Senate for passage. There is nothing that will be different from when we buy a house and expect to have a roof that works. And uh, you were going to say, Mr. Levin? Uh, the reconciliation bill will amend the Senate bill that became law. We'll amend the law. We'll amend the law. Yeah, right. Yeah, I said the Senate bill which became law. What my colleague from That's the answer. I, I will, but I've had a number of requests. So let, let, I'll, let me, let, I will, I will. I didn't, I'll, I'll, I didn't let, uh, David, David asked me for it. Yes. But I, I'd like to make a point before I yield, and I, Indeed. I will. And, and, and just take... Yeah, 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 we've got 200 people. Slow. Okay, oh, yeah. just take, take note of, and, and, I, and I'm glad that Mr. Waxman pointed out, and, and others have reiterated, we're going to pass the Senate bill. If it's deemed passed, or if whatever word is used, uh, there is going to be a legitimate case and controversy, uh, and uh, I would thus have hoped, and again, Mr. Barton made the argument initially, at 10 in the morning, uh, that regular order, much more regular order, certainly, would have been used. I am not sure, because I think this is going to be a, 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 a new issue presented to the Supreme Court. Uh, I, I am not sure that this is going to pass constitutional muster. Obviously, I'm not going to make a conclusion, but I'll say this, that it, it is one more reason for more regular order uh, to, have been, to have been followed. Could I Mr. Levin and maybe yes. Chairwoman Slaughter, let's assume that we pass a rule that deems the Senate bill right. passed. Which is what seems as Then we're going to debate a reconciliation package. While we're debating the reconciliation package, is the President of the United States going to sign this bill that we just deemed passed? If he doesn't, it ain't a law. I don't think it's a law anyway. No, he'll he sign. He has to sign. No, Joe, he's going to he's, he's going to sign the Senate bill. 
I mean, we're, I don't know. I don't know how much time we're going to have between the rule vote and the right. final vote on reconciliation. But it's and remember, it's probably not going to be sign days. The Senate bill, if this passes tomorrow, he'll sign the Senate bill, and then it remains to be seen what, if anything else, I understand. Yeah. Passed by this. I agree with anyway. you on that. But uh, my uh, point is, I'll yield to my friends. Uh, Dave, when does that uh, deemed make, bill? Let me just let me just make a. Point. The president of the United States yeah, has to sign bill. something for anything to become a law, the unless y'all have changed that in the rule too. The Senate bill. Go ahead, David. Okay, Madam Chair, let me just so that's, say that's, that's going to happen in this two hour period. Mr. Diaz Boyle just yielded to me. Here, here is the question that I think is a very, very important one as people have talked about the fact that nobody likes the Senate bill, and yet hmm. that is going to be public law, correct? We all acknowledge it's going to be public law. What guarantee do we have in light of the fact that the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, Kent Conrad, said that he believed that there would be bird rule <laughs> changes? that come about, that we are not going to end up with nothing but the Senate bill. In fact, the only guarantee that we are going to emerge from, based on the process that is before us, is that the extraordinarily unpopular bill that everybody hates is going to be public law. And we are going to be left with, we're going to be left with a hope that our colleagues in the other body just might be able to do what happened back in 1983 and do this without modifications. Yeah. But since it's only happened one time since the 1974 Budget and Empowerment Act was put into place, guess what? And based on the fact that the Senate Budget Committee Chairman said what he did, it ain't going to happen. And I thank my Mr. friend. Mr. Lee, it won't Richard be a hope. Mayor, may I, may I <laughs> respond it, to it, your it question? It won't be a hope. Yes. Yes. The reporter can hear. Yes. The reporter can hear. No, but this is an important, let's important let's discussion, Madam Chair. It really right, is. And, and, let's, and let's we're talking across each other. Of course. One at a time. Let's say if you are need to do this, but this is uh, uh, obviously something that will be decided when the rule is written. We're in our, that's no, of course, I agree. All right. And, 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 I, and, I, and I'd like I, not to spend all our time on hypothetical here. No, that's but at the same right. time, it is, I think, evident that we have a constitutional responsibility to vote on the same text. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, I think some progress seems, well, in the discussion currently has been made in terms of the fact that, yes, we will pass out a bill that was passed by the other body. That's constitutionally required. Now, um, uh, I think Mr. Dreyer has emphasized correctly so that, every, as I mentioned before, everything else is speculative. Everything else is a question mark. Mr. Waxman, you had a point? Well, I had And I will yield to you. I will yield to you, but Mr. Waxman. Well, it's up to the to chair. To no, it's my time. I can yield to you. If you want time, you can speak now. I, it's an interesting committee where each member gets unlimited time. This is yes. the only committee. And we're very that, proud of that. Uh, we're very proud of that. Okay. Well, I wanted to say that, uh, <laughs> that, that, I, don't hate floor, the, that I don't hate the Senate bill. The Senate bill has a lot of features in it that were in the House bill, but there are some features that we want to change. But we're not allowed to amend the Senate bill and send it back because then the Senate would have to have 60 votes to stop a filibuster. So we are required Life to use the reconciliation sometimes. process to change the Senate bill on some of those areas where I, I think it makes sense to change it. But in the meantime, we'll be reconciling the law, and the law will be the Senate passed bill. We'll put that into law. That comes from a vote of the House. Yes. And then the reconciliation bill is the only way we can with a majority vote. American people should be astounded that their Senate cannot act by a majority vote if, uh, if, if a small minority prevents it. So um, th this will allow a majority vote in the House and the Senate to make changes in the Senate bill. But it's not that the Senate bill is so terrible that we all hate it. There are things we'd like to change it. That's, uh, that's what we do all the time. We change current law. And the current law will be the Senate bill once it's voted on by the House. Let me yield to my friend, Mr. Hayes. I, I, I thank you. And I ask my friend, well, would you be mindful of uh, the fact that at another point in time, you voted um, in a manner uh, uh, to Dean. allow? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'll, and I'll say this. I know it's been done before. Uh, and and uh, what I would say is that certainly, and the reason why I think this is going to be a, an instance of uh, a, a first-time consideration by a new, a new question by the Supreme Court, is because uh, on matters where it was done before, it certainly did not have the impact. Certainly, they, they well, certainly did not have. They certainly did not have the impact, the interest, 
Would, they were, would, uh, would and, my friend and, continue and, and, to yield? Of course. You and I were here in 1996 when we passed the line item veto, and I can't imagine that you um, uh, have forgotten um, uh, that a significant number of people in this country were focused on the line item veto. It was talked about in mine and your state. Our mm -hmm. state governor does have a line item veto. Uh, Mr. Dreyer voted for it in 1996. Mr. Barton voted for it in 1996. Mm -hmm. The leader of the uh, Republicans, Mr. Boehner, voted for it in 1996. And now all of a sudden, when we and 90 percent of the American people supported it in 1996. That uh, you you say that I hear no, you all. The poll the poll said that. Do I have the time, oh, Madam Chair? Mr. Hastings, Mr. Hastings has the Just time. You all on in the minority continue to say what the American people Let's think. Let's I think you don't, don't know what Never. all of the American people think. But we think. do. We and do. You certainly don't know what those. But we do read the polls, polls Mr. Hastings. Of this bill. <laughs> Reclaiming my time, Excuse, Mr. Diaz Ballard, we need to vote. Yes. We are, I would yes. like now that we go down to vote. And that Reclaiming my time, if I may. Just a moment. May I? Yes, Just of course. Thank you. We have four votes. The first is 15-minute vote, which is nearly over. At the beginning, after you have voted the last vote, would you come back? I, I, I just Thank would like to say much. to my friend, uh, Mr. Hastings, that uh, <laughs> after that vote is when the Supreme Court made clear and emphasize the importance of exact language. And that's what the point that I'm making today. Anyways, thank you all very much. And the House Rules Committee uh, in recess at the moment. Members on their way to the House floor. A series of floor vote, uh, four votes underway. Uh, the House Rules Committee meeting today to consider changes to the health care reconciliation bill. Uh, they, this is one of two health care bills the House considering tomorrow. One passed by the Senate in December. And a second, the reconciliation bill making changes uh, to the federal student loan program. And today, again, uh, the House Rules Committee setting floor debate parameters for the two health care bills.